We have a joke in the Netherlands that goes as follows. How can you tell that you've entered the Netherlands? There's toilet paper hanging out to dry. And while it isn't quite that bad, it is true that we are incredibly stingy. I mean, there's a reason that splitting the bill is called going Dutch. So with that in mind, how is it possible that in the winter of 1636 to 1637, we collectively lost our minds and paid amounts that could buy you several houses for flowers? Tulip mania has been a subject of popular fascination and ridicule for several centuries. The mania is one of the go-to cautionary tales every time signs of a financial bubble appear, and it is easy to see why. It was the first recorded speculative financial bubble, and its subject is one of the strangest ever seen. To understand the Dutch obsession for tulips, you need to understand the Dutch society of the time. The Dutch Republic had recently won its independence from Spain. Due to the still ongoing war, the port of Antwerp was blockaded, which caused traders to instead go up to the ports of the northern Netherlands. Trade companies like the VOC and the WIC were set up, and the country began to prosper. This influx in cash brought with it an increase in spending power. The newly rich merchants became interested in all sorts of exotics and curiosities coming in on the trade ships. Among the most coveted items were animals, shells, paintings, and, of course, tulips. Tulips were especially popular for a myriad of reasons. First of all, they came in a lot of varieties. Both the flower's color schemes and patterns could vary wildly. This variety led to scarcity for certain variants, and scarcity naturally led to desirability. These varieties were not only present between flowers, but also in individuals. Due to reasons that were unknown at the time, flowers could change pattern or color from year to year. This uncertainty created the sort of loot box effect, which made them all the more enticing. Flowers that were worthless one year would with a bit of luck become extremely valuable the next, or vice versa. Finally, the tulips were just plain beautiful. This interest in tulips naturally created the market. At first, the flowers were not sold for money. Instead, they are often exchanged within the tulip community, either in exchange for flowers or as a gift, in the understanding that they would later get something in return. These initial communities of flower enthusiasts, who call themselves leafhabbers, were quite close-knit, and they became a reason to partake in the tulip trade in and of themselves. But with the value of the flowers increasing, this harmony could not last. Flowers were now being sold by merchants, and the once tight-knit community started to fracture. Once the common people started to take an interest in flowers, the community aspect was mostly gone. Oftentimes, a divide is made between the leafhabbers, who own tulips because of a passion, and the traders, who simply treated them as a commodity. This distinction, however, is not that clear, as many of the early leafhabbers would later partake in the flower trade, and even as early as 1574, a leafhabber by the name of Camarius had already paid for some seeds. Once the flower market had been established, prices slowly started to rise. In 1634, prices continued to rise, but much faster than before. This increase in prices coincides with the end of the first phase of the Thirty Years' War. Signs of a nearing end to the most destructive conflict Europe had ever seen started to appear, which obviously put people in a happy mood and gave them more time for superficial interests like tulips. However, in 1636, the war was turned around at the Battle of Wittstock. This forced a lot of German tulip owners to sell, which flooded the market and caused the prices to crash. Tulips were now worth less than they had been before 1634. After this drop, prices started to rise again, and they quickly reached new heights. What exactly happened next is subject to debate. The popular telling says that everyone and their dog became interested in the trade. Johann Beckmann wrote, Oft did a nobleman purchase of a chimney sweep tulips to the amount of 200 florins, and sell them at the same time to a farmer. And neither the nobleman, chimney sweep, nor farmer actually held roots in their possession, nor did they want them. The existing evidence, however, paints a very different picture. When looking at surviving records, historian Anna Goldgar only found 285 people who had ever purchased or sold a tulip in Haarlem, which was the tulip capital at the time. Similar low numbers were found in other Dutch cities. While the extent to which the country was involved in the trade was exaggerated, the prices were not. At the peak of the mania, one auction of around 40 flowers yielded a reported 90,000 florins, and one individual of the most expensive variety, a Semper Augustus, was sold for 6,000. For comparison, a simple house would run you about a thousand florins. Tulips continued to be sold at these prices, until one day, they suddenly were not. According to the propaganda pamphlet Samenspraak tussen Vermont and de Gaargoed, which admittedly 
is not the most reliable source. On February 3rd, a seller in Haarlem failed to sell his wares, which he first offered for 1250, then 1100, then 1000. Word of this spread, and soon prices everywhere started to crash. What exactly caused the prices to fall is still unclear. One suggested reason is an excess of supply. The rising prices had caused breeders to try and produce as many tulips as they could, which could have flooded the market. Others have suggested that amateurs got bored and started selling their tulips. Perhaps buyers simply didn't think that these absurd prices could be sustained. Or maybe the fall, just like the rise, had no rational explanation at all. The effects of this crash have again been wildly exaggerated over the years. According to popular myth, many people became bankrupt as a consequence of the crash and the nation's economy took a substantial hit. Again, this story is not backed up by the actual evidence. There are very few records of tulip traders who went bankrupt, and of the existing cases, doubt exists over whether tulip mania was the sole cause. The economy was also doing just fine. In fact, spending power and standards of living continue to rise for at least a few more decades. The real crisis caused by tulip mania was not financial, but social. Much of the tulip trade was based on trust. There was only a very limited time frame in which the tulips could actually be moved. At the time a trade was agreed, neither the tulips nor the money actually exchanged hands. Instead, the buyer had the pinky promise to pay the seller when the time to move the tulips came, and the seller, in turn, promised not to sell a bulb to anyone else. Often, the buyer would then sell the tulips onto a third party without actually being in possession of the bulb. This system worked fine when the prices were relatively stable, but if, hypothetically speaking, an exponential rise in prices followed by a big crash were to occur, you could see how it might cause some problems. When the prices were on the rise between 1634 and 1636, sellers would often cancel a previously arranged deal, knowing that their wares could now fetch a higher price. After the crash, the shoe was on the other foot. Now buyers refused to show up for agreed deals, leaving sellers with their now worthless flowers. Honor and trustworthiness had been important values in Dutch society. One of the worst insults you could throw at a man was to call him cheating in business. A lot of trades that were vital to the Dutch economy relied on mutual trust. With many buyers defaulting on their promise, this trust was now shattered. To attempt to somewhat mend the broken relations, many disgruntled buyers and sellers turned to the courts. The different courts, predictably, returned different verdicts and when a plaintiff didn't like the results of one, they would simply go to another. On February 23rd, representatives from many of the Tudor trade hotspots gathered to decide on a clear way forward. They decided that deals made before the end of November 1636, right before the start of the rise, would go through. Any transactions after that would be cancelled, should the buyer declare their intent before the end of March and pay 10% of the agreed price as a fine. This compromise made nobody happy, and since the council that made it held no real power, they opted to ignore it. The next planting season was fast approaching, which would cause additional problems. This is the time when the promised transactions were supposed to take place, and if no solution was in place before then, sellers would have to wait another year before they could sell their wares. So a real solution was needed, and preferably sooner rather than later. On April 27th, the highest court came up with a statement. It read, I don't know, that seems like more of a you problem than a me problem to me. This reluctance of the court to actually do something came from the fact that they saw the tulip trade as a form of gambling, and it was therefore unenforceable by law. It is hard not to see this stance as a bit hypocritical, as many officials took part in the trade, and the government had even considered putting a tax on tulips only a few months earlier. On January 30th, 1638, almost a full year after the original crash, Harlem set up a commission to deal with the many quarrels that were still going strong. Similar panels were set up in cities throughout the country. At first, these commissions tried to force the buyers to pay in full, but they quickly found out that this was not going to happen. Instead, they ruled that the contract would only be settled with a fee of 3.5% of the original price. Again, neither side was happy with this, and cases that had been before the commission would later turn up at the regular courts, to no avail. In the end, no real solution was reached, with some sellers still chasing their money well into the 1640s. Thank you for watching, I've been Thomas, and I hope to see you next video where I talk about pies. Hiya!